Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, it's with great pleasure that I introduce Ben Chidesta, who is an intern on the Microsoft Research Outreach team this summer. He is a PhD student at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, advised by Professor Min Do. His research interest lies in image processing and statistical learning, and his work focuses on applications in the bioimaging domain. Uh, his talk, he's, he's done some great work with us this summer, uh, applying his uh, problem on Azure, applying deep neural networks, uh, and trying some different implementations on Azure. And his talk today is titled Cell Classification of FTIR Spectroscopic Data for Histopathology Using Neural Networks. Welcome, Ben. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Vani, and thanks for joining. Um, so Vani introduced the title already. So there's a lot of things there, but I'm going to go through them a little bit, introduce them one at a time, what all the different what all those different terms are uh, for. Um, so as a brief outline of what this talk will include, I'll first talk about the application of FTIR, or which stands for Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy for histopathology, um, and some of the current challenges with that work and the motivation for using deep neural networks um, in this with this FTIR data. Um, I'll also talk about implementing um, DNNs on Azure and what Azure can um, bring to the table. And then finally, kind of culminating all of these different steps is um, actually classifying cells um, of FTIR data um, to aid in the process of histopathology. So uh, to begin, I'll start with just describing a bit about what is Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. Um, it is a type of chemical imaging that uses infrared light. So infrared light is emitted from a source, and uh, it passes through a beam slitter, um, which allows uh, you have a translating mirror here. Um, so you can change the phase of the light that's returning to the original source. And um, they interfere with one another, and they pass through the sample. They're detected. And uh, this detector records what's called an interferogram which if you use the Fourier transform can get you um, a measure of absorption. So um, as this infrared light passes through, it resonates with the sample um, with some of the vibrational frequencies of functional groups of molecules, and then it's absorbed. Um, other, otherwise, it passes through. And um, we get a spectrum here of, for different frequencies of infrared light, how much is absorbed and how much is passes, passes through. Um, and then for each, uh, pixel, or each, each spot in the sample, we have the spectrum. If we put them all together, we get like a th well, there's a 3D volume. So if I look down one pixel through the 3D volume, I'll see the spectrum. Um, and then at each frequency, I have an image, which is a measure, which is an absorption um, map. So for every frequency, I'll have a different image. Um, yeah, so that's the way that FTIR, FTIR works. So in the end, you have not one single image, but actually a, this 3D volume. Um, the resolution of FDIR is about five microns. Um, so at each one of these spectrum, we're seeing the response of possibly several cells, possibly a pure region of one cell, but possibly several cells overlapping. Um, <clears throat> so this spectrum actually tells us a lot about the molecular composition of, and chemical composition of what's inside the sample. So that's where its power comes in. Um, so Normal histopathology, um, if you want to go to a doctor to look at a, um, a tumor to see if it's cancerous or not, um, a doctor would take a, do a biopsy and extract a core from um, the site. And each, the core is sliced very thinly into different slices. Um, each one of these slices is then stained um, and usually using like H&E staining. And from this, a doctor will observe under a microscope the structure, and then from the structure will decide, a pathologist will decide if, if this is cancerous or not, or the grading of cancer. Um, so they're looking for things in this, the structure of, of this data. So with FTIR, we're proposing to replace this staining stage 
Um, so instead of doing the staining, um, we actually image each slice. And we have this 3D volume and spectrum. And then from the spectrum, at each pixel, I can, looking at the spectrum, I can tell what, a lot about the um, molecular composition. And I can create, actually, a map of the different cell types that are found there. Um, so some of the key players are things like epithelium or collagen or fibroblasts. And um, from this, then a, a pathologist could look at this map and make a diagnosis about cancer or the, the grading of cancer. Um, and what we'd like to do is to automate this task of labeling um, using machine learning. Um, so that's kind of the current uh, process, but this hasn't really seen much clinical use yet because of a couple of different drawbacks. Um, one of the main ones is that the imaging is very, it's very slow. So to image a core could take about a day. Um, and if you're trying to see several patients a day, um, this is kind of prohibitive. We'd want to see more, maybe like 30 minutes to for a patient's core, not a day. Um, another issue is that to, to know what the cell um, label should be requires a lot of insight by a pathologist or someone who's trained to be able to look at this spectrum and say what this cell type is. Um, <clears throat> and so the features that cur are currently being looked at for doing this classification, they are designed, these metrics are designed by pathologists. Um, and another problem is that these um, features are specific to each tissue type. So um, this spectrum for a certain cell type may change from breast uh, or to prostate tissue. So if we want to extend to a new tissue type, then we have to create new features each time and, and you know, tune them and engineer them and see which ones work the best. Um, so this is what we, my project is looking at, is um, this pipeline of classifying this data. So I have my spectrum input, and I'd have some sort of feature extraction uh, classification stage, and then in the output, I would have a cell label. Um, so what we're proposing is to look at deep learning for doing this uh, classification process. So in deep learning, I no longer have the feature extraction stage. Um, I actually just have a neural network. And I can feed into my neural network uh, just the individual data points themselves, the absorptions at each frequency, um, as n input nodes to a network. Um, and I can train this network um, and and get out the class label. So um, neural networks have a lot of advantages. Um, one of the key ones for, for us is looking at uh, learning the features automatically. So I no longer need the pathologist to tell me what things are important or what kind of uh, um, metrics I should be looking for. I can actually try to learn these on our, on our own without any prior knowledge. Um, they've also been shown to provide very high classification accuracy in a lot of problems like speech and image uh, classification. Um, but it also um, we face some challenges with using deep learning, um, which if anyone's worked with deep learning, you know it requires a significant amount of computational resources um, and parameter tuning. And uh, what is also a challenge is the more data, the better. So it's for all these, which is a good thing, but also can be a bad thing. It, it's, it's, if you have enough data, then it can, they can work well. But if you're limited on data, um, it can be a problem. <clears throat> so um, to help with this computational resource uh, constraint and parameter tuning is where uh, Azure comes into play. So um, using Azure for, for data science problems, we can actually have create lots of different virtual machines in the cloud, um, which I can access through the Azure portal or through SSH. It can be Windows or Linux machines. Um, I can have storage, and I can store on my, on, on my storage accounts a virtual hard disk that can contain my data, or um, blobs is, is Azure's type of file storage. Um, and I also have access to APIs in Python or different languages to access these virtual machines and, um, and my data. <clears throat> so uh, in terms of uh, parallelizing or distributing this task, um, it's kind of two approaches that that are used or that we could take. Um, so uh, let's see. The the simplest approach would be what we could call embarrassingly parallel, which is the the terminology that's used 
um, in this area. So basically, in each virtual machine, I just have um, a neural network, and I train independent of each, each other. And maybe I have a head node that um, kind of organizes and, and uh, distributes the workload. So when one virtual machine is done, it reports back, and then it, it gives a new job to another one. A more sophisticated method would be something like um, that's very I.O. intensive, where maybe I'm training one network, and I'm distributing the work across many uh, virtual machines, possibly asynchronously, and they're all um, kind of doing different tasks and reporting back to the head node. So um, this is a more sophisticated approach. This is a more simple approach. Um, so this might be the ideal, the I.O. intensive. But I actually think that just doing this embarrassingly parallel, again, you can, there's a lot to be gained. Um, as a lot of the work and time that's spent in deep learning is tuning these hyperparameters, um, which we can do without the need for this more intensive um, parallelization. Uh, so also, if you look at the libraries out there, another limitation is that not many of the libraries um, allow for this kind of intense parallelization. So there's a lot of data, there's a lot on this slide. Um, but if you work with deep learning, then maybe you're familiar with some of these libraries. Um, but the one I'd like to point out, or a couple I'd like to point out um, to use in one particular that I'm using is Theano, which, or PyLearn2, which is built on top of Theano. So it offers a lot of um, deep learning um, already implemented networks. It's also quite actively maintained. And uh, as new features in deep learning are coming out, um, they're pretty good about adding them into, the, um, into their code base. Um, Another one, other good ones are like Cafe um, and Torch 7. Um, Cafe, especially if you're interested in doing convolutional neural networks, which is something I may turn to um, in the future. But uh, I definitely would recommend looking at those as well. But uh, mostly I picked PyLearn 2 um, because it's very easy to use. Um, it's in Python, which is something I'm familiar with. And um, it was pretty, pretty easy just for getting started with. And if you're interested in knowing more about these libraries, like you can talk afterward. Uh, so um, I'll describe my setup in Azure and how I'm using Azure to do, the, this, do this deep learning uh, training. So I have, if you start with the portal in the cloud, um, I can create my virtual machine in, through the portal. And I can SSH into it, I make a Linux machine, for instance. Um, and I can install all of my favorite Python libraries or whatever libraries you may want to include. Um, and I can create a storage account where I let I hook to the VM and where I store um, my FTR data set. So that's what I currently have operating. And once I have this VM um, created, then I can just I just copied it and can make more instances um, of the same VM and connect each one of them to the same data set and access all of them through SSH. And uh, using Python I, scripts, I can kind of delegate different, uh, um, different tasks or different networks for each of the machines. So I want to show a little bit just of my Azure setup. Um, let's see. So the portal is really easy to access. It's just manage.windowsazure.com. Oop, but I don't seem to have the server. Uh, let's see. Oh, lost connectivity. Let's try again. Okay, here we go. Uh, so I can load up the portal and uh, shows all of my items that I have. I can look at my virtual machines, and here I have. So I have five virtual machines currently running. Um, a group at Illinois is called CIG, so I've called it CIG PyLearn and then the instance number. So I can look at one of these and um, go to the dashboard. And currently, it's not doing too much. Um, this is an 8-core machine, and it has um, 14 gigabytes of memory. So um, with Azure Research for, Azure for Research, you can get up to 32 cores, which is what I'm using currently, um, <clears throat> arranging in different sizes. And uh, I can also also have my storage accounts. Oops, there we go. So I have a storage account called CID General Store, and on here I have my containers, virtual hard drives, 
and I can see all the hard disks from my the operating system of my virtual machines, and also this top one, BRC961, which is the FTIR data set that I'm using. And so on here, it's really easy to like, create new um, virtual machines or uh, create new storage accounts. It's very easy to manage everything. The other great thing about this is that um, I don't have to worry about actually managing all the hardware of a cluster or a server. So our, like our group at Illinois has an old server we got from an old group, but now it's basically not really usable. It's become so old um, that it's, you know, it's obsolete in terms of what's, what's currently out there. But with Azure, I can just have, I have access to the most recent you know, uh, hardware, and I don't have to worry about maintaining the hardware or backing up things. So it's pretty, um, pretty nice in that sense. Uh, okay. Okay, so now I'll talk just about um, actually doing uh, class label, cell class labeling using FTIR. Um, so the data set that we have for our uh, experiments is about um, 97 samples. So if you can see, each one of these is a sample, like a slice taken from a core of a biopsy. Um, so from each sample, there's about 200 by 200 pixels or so, so each pixel of spectra. So that's about 2 million spectra, of, of which about um, 500,000 are labeled. Um, and then this is just one image for one frequency the response, but we would have um, in an image for each different frequency band, so 501 bands. And then there are seven different cell types that we're looking at. Um, and uh, these ones we've, that are labeled were labeled by um, a specialist. And um, you'll notice there are some holes in the data. Those are not like missing cells or anything. It's just sometimes the cells may be constituted of multiple different cell types or they may be hard to identify. So these ones we have labeled are what are considered, you know, for, sure, for certain, this is the cell type it is, so for using for training. And so I've, I split it up into about 70% training, 10% validation, 20% testing. Um, and this is the, the setup uh, that I am using. So uh, <clears throat> ex I extracted a spectrum from the 3D volume, and I just store the, all the spectra in a two, big 2D matrix. So each row is, uh, is a spectrum. And then these are the, f across the row is the different, their response for different frequencies. And then I just feed this spectrum into the neural network. <clears throat> Um, this is actually a little bit misleading because there's not one node at the output, but there's actually seven for each of the classes. So each, each node representing a, a probability of, of that class. And then um, for the experiments, I used like two to four layers. Um, but this is kind of preliminary work, so I, there's no reason not to go uh, for more. So I'll be looking to do more, trying more layers in different configurations. Also just using like 100 to 500 nodes per layer, but again, I, you know, there's no reason that, that I can't go, we can't go higher. Um, then I'm just using the entire data as the input layer for 500, 501 nodes. Um, if you're familiar with deep learning, there's a lot of different activation functions you can use. It's another part of the tuning, and I'm using rectified linear units <coughs> and softmax regression for the output. And then at the output, we'd be getting um, actually just one label, which would constitute a, um, an entire cell map. Um, so some of the results I've gotten just for some of the networks um, that, that did the best. Um, it, so using it, the rectified linear units for activation um, and then some different configuration of layers and those. This is just the number of nodes per layer and for each layer, so first layer, second layer. Um, and then accuracy is around close to 90%. Um, but I think there's a lot of room for improvement. Uh, so, I, and that's part of the deep learning uh, work is continuing to search different sets of hyperparameters and um, different configurations and different learning rates can get, can get better results. So that'll be something I'll be looking toward the future toward, toward improving these results. Um, let's see, okay, so <clears throat> in conclusion, uh, FTR spectroscopy, um, but there's a lot of potential to provide you know, quality or quanti uh, not qualitative, quantitative 
um, morphological and molecular information for histopathology. Um, and there's a lot of, there's still a great need in histopathology for more accurate um, diagnosis. So we're hoping that FTIR can aid greatly in that. Um, and using uh, deep neural networks, this allows for accurate cell classification and hoping to continue to improve without the need for doing feature engineering or having domain knowledge. Um, and with Azure, we can, you know, I was able to parallelize um, this uh, parameter search, uh, which greatly expedites the process of searching for hyperparameters. Uh, so to acknowledge just some people who are helping me, I'd really like to thank Vani, my mentor, and Harold, um, uh, just for the opportunity here to intern at Microsoft, and some of uh, the staff I talked with, Lee Dung or Trishel, were really helpful, gave great insight. Other interns like David, thanks for, for their um, helpful conversations. And then my advisor back at Illinois and the group we work with at Illinois, Professor Rohit Bhargava, and um, other members of his group. So that concludes my talk. So thanks for your attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yeah. Can you talk about the future direction? Oh, yeah. Um, I don't think I have a slide in here for it, actually. But um, so uh, let's see. Yeah, so I think in the future, um, oops, that's not in. Let's go back to the spectroscopy picture. Um, one thing that I'd, we're hoping to do is to try to take more advantage of this, uh, like the spatial data that we have, information. So not just labeling each spectrum individually, but trying to make use of the entire, um, the entire 3D volume. Um, that would be one. That's one thing. Um, and also, uh, if I go back to this histopathology section. Or slide. Uh, I think the, the ultimate goal is really to automate this whole process. So um, maybe we get to the, lay, the cell map, and then from the cell map, actually doing using morphological features, doing machine learning on top of this to create a diagnosis or a grading of cancer or um, labeling cancerous pixels. Um, not necessarily to replace the pathologist. But there's a great need for a second opinion. So there can often be a lot of inconsistency between pathologists with diagnosis, or even a pathologist, if doing subsequent diagnosis of the same sample, can give different, um, can different diagnoses. So <clears throat> we're hoping that an automated histopathology process could actually aid a, aid a doctor in giving a second opinion. Uh, um, but that's the, yeah, the, the future goal and direction of it. Love it. Any other questions? Um, just kind of a curiosity. How long does it take to uh, go through the process of labeling like a single image once the neural network's been trained? Uh, oh, to label a single image? A single volume, I guess. A single uh, uh, spectra from the core. Once it's been trained, the labeling is quite fast. Yeah. It's mostly just in the training, it takes a long time. So, training these networks. It can take um, a few hours uh, or several hours usually for per configuration. Yeah, that's what I've found so far. But the labeling is pretty quick. Yeah. Do you use the IO intensive uh, training or the? Uh, no, I'm not using that. Yeah, so I'm uh, not using. I'm not using this method. I'm just using the simple, embarrassingly parallel. Try to train different kinds of models. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So each machine has its own set of hyper configuration of a neural network and it trains on its own. Um, so projects like Atom do this style of parallelization. Um, or BeliefNet by Andrew Ung, uh, I think, does something like this. But, but, I, but I'm not doing, doing that, yeah. Another question about the images. Uh, so when you do FTIR image, isn't the, it's not a single slice, right? It's a 3D, uh, when you take, do biopsy, it's a 3D mass or not? Or is it like a... Yeah. Uh, so I didn't get that. 
It's, uh, let's see, where was it here? Yeah. When you mean tree plantings, does that mean that it, it takes pain? So if I have a volume, like mm -hmm. in a CT scan, I would say every slice is, so when you make a 3D volume from CT scan, it just describes the organ in 3D. Okay. But here it's, it's not the case, right? This is for... Yeah. A cell in 2D or? Yeah, so you, it actually would be like 4D technically because you yeah, have. It is, it should yeah. be 4D. Because you have, for each slice in the core, you have a 3D volume. Um, okay. And then you'd have, so the fourth dimension is, is among like slices. 4D, then that, in that sense, or how are you classifying it? Um, I'm just using, yeah, per, I'm only considering like one slice of the core, not, not the not whole the, okay. thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, but. Yeah, so I'm just one slice, and then I'm using just just that slice, imaging it, and which gives you the 3D volume, and then uh, doing the labeling from there. When you said 97 samples, is it 97 slices? From slices, yeah, from okay. cores, yeah, exactly. Uh, any other questions? Okay, thanks for your attention.